Boa noite, pessoal. Estamos aqui hoje recebendo o Marquinhos, que já entrou aí, ó. olha que menino pontual. Fala, Alvin. Tudo bom? Bom tempo, hein? Como é que você tá? Tá no Brasil? Porra, tô... Acho que foi, foi a... Pode passar, pode passar. Opa! E aí, meu querido, tudo bem? E aí, tudo bem, e você? Tudo ótimo. Cara, acho que é a conversa mais uhum. pontual que a gente já fez até hoje. Ah, é, pô. Feliz aí. Obrigado pelo convite, viu? Guys, so, uh, let me just put my headphones on. This is Marcus. He, uh, Hi, everyone. He'll tell you guys a little bit more about himself, but um, this is going to be a conversation about technical development. We're always trying to bring uh, relevant topics for everyone to get more information. Um, and Marcos has been very involved in the sport, not only in foot volley, but also in beach soccer. And uh, he can tell you guys more information. But um, we're going to go throughout this conversation in English. But we're going to stop after every topic to clarify any questions, maybe provide some translation to Portuguese. Uh, should you have any doubts, but hopefully we're going to have a lot of people that are English speakers on this conversation, but, um, uh, maybe Marcus, you can start getting your, uh, Oh, look, tech ball. <laughs> Aí, ó, tá famoso. Yeah. Quem entrou? Foot Volley Colombia knows you from tech ball. Ah, nice people. Nice people. <laughs> tech ball family. Uh, apparently you're getting famous in different sports now. <laughs> So um, just giving a little bit more time uh, for more people to show up and uh, not miss any part of it because it's going to be a very interesting conversation. Um, but uh, I believe you can go ahead little by little, tell everyone a little bit more about yourself, and mm -hmm. uh, we'll move on. Thank you. Okay. Anyway. And thanks again for the invitation. And I'm always happy <clears throat> to to work with World Food Volley. And, uh, okay, let me introduce myself. I'm Marcos Vieira. I'm 33 years old. I'm from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And I coach Food Volley for 10 years. This year, I'm celebrating 10 years of, you know, since I started with Beco at Copacabana. Beco? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Beco. That Very now, traditional um, coach in Rio. Yeah, works with uh, Leo Tubarão. He okay. works at the same place. No, yeah. no need for introductions for Leo Tubarão. Yes, of Everyone course. Everyone knows Leo. Everyone knows him. And uh, since uh, I'm a kid, I'm involved. You know, I was born at the beach, so everything related to foot volley, uh, beach soccer, and games around the area where foot volley was played, you know, I, I was born with it. So uh, for this long time, I'm involved with foot volley. I, I, I got my first uh, game when I was 10 years old. I was like only playing the second balls, you know, I could barely, you know, handle it because the ball was so heavy. But uh, When I was 14, I started uh, playing for for Rio and get more games, more time. And, you know, I started loving foot volley since that time. But at the same time, I was uh, playing professional football here in Rio. So I was struggling with these two games, like training at the morning and playing foot volley the rest of the day. So I could uh, keep these two passions of mine. But... Unfortunately, uh, like when I was 22, I quit uh, football. I had two surgeries on my knees and I, I could uh, like know more about the game like when I learned with Beko. And since then, it's my uh, passion. I do it every day when I can. I work with it every day, every morning. And, and I'm very happy to like how my life developed because of foot volley because we're gonna yes 
Então, Marquinhos, para o pessoal que não está entendendo muito o que ele está falando aqui, ele também fala português, mas se você tiver que falar inglês e português, vai ficar muita coisa para você ficar falando. Ele está hum. mencionando aqui que ele nasceu na, no futebol, ele já desde criança joga com a família ou com amigos, com amigos na, é. Meu nas praias é da Zona Sul é, e cresceu no meio de grandes uh, treinadores e jogadores. Ele começou a aprender um pouco mais a fundo a técnica do futebol e como ensinar também com o Beco, que é um cara muito reconhecido aqui no, no Rio. Uh, para os que não conhecem o Beco, o Beco trabalha em conjunto com o Léo Tubarão, e eu tenho certeza que o Léo Tubarão, uh, praticamente todas as pessoas aqui já, já ouviram falar ou conhecem, e toda essa experiência dele manteve ele motivado para evoluir uh, o conhecimento dele no esporte, e ele seguiu um caminho muito mais focado em compartilhar ensinamento uh, comparado com, com competir em alto nível. Com, com certeza o Marquinhos competiu Diversos, diversos torneios aí ao longo dos anos, mas uh, o foco dele não tem sido 100% em participar de competições internacionais, enfim, uh, uh, o foco dele tem sido mais aprender técnicas uh, de ensinamento do futebol e é isso aqui que a gente vai estar tentando compartilhar com o pessoal, com foco prioritário em inglês, tá? Para o pessoal que nunca consegue entender essa informação que o pessoal compartilha uh, no dia a dia. Um, so, Marcus, uh, just going a little bit further into you, um, maybe share with everyone a little bit more about your academic uh, um, knowledge. Uh, you have gone to university to study uh, physical education, and you've learned a lot more on the technical aspects of food volley um, from just being around it for, as you mentioned, 10, over 10 years, so maybe just 10 years. Tell everyone a little bit more about what you feel qualifies yourself to be able to here today to be here today and share more information with everyone maybe also some athletes that you've also coached in the past yeah after i i quit football uh, it was a natural path for me to go to study sports at the university so i could uh, understand better how uh, football work, which muscles are main using, uh, used at the sport. I could understand better uh, how to de develop uh, steps for beginners and create my, my own way to teach. Of course, I was uh, based on Beko uh, uh, instructions and other people around me, like I learned a lot with Alinho and other uh, legends from football, but Uh, I could uh, create my my own program. Not it's not the best one. It's not the the, the true, you know. But I could uh, see um, from the years that it helped a lot, and it helps a lot. And like uh, when you teach to beginners, and you have to you have you need a plan. You need a plan to give them what they need, when they need, and like... And keep them motivated. Yeah, keeping them motivated. And yeah. it's a challenge every day because football is not easy, as we all know. And there are a lot of people around the world that, wants, that, that, that want some information about it. And yeah, let's, let's try to help them. Yeah, we're, we're doing our part here, just sharing some of the information. Um, Moving on to the next topic, I don't think we had that many questions by now, so we can move on. Do we have anything? Quer que traduz aí, Marquinhos? Aí, traduz aí, Diego. Quem? O Diego está pedindo. Futebol em Peru. Galera está entrando aí agora. Filu, ça va bien. Didi, ó, o alemão aí. Ó. Japa entrando. Didi. Grande Japa. Fala, Japa Dani. Traque. Oh, Dani. Dani é baiano, pô, né? Passando então do, do lado Marquinhos e vamos passar um pouco para o lado um, treinamento de futebol. So, moving on from uh, Marcus' introduction, we're going to start with our first topic, which is understanding uh, training methodology in football, which is um, a big question mark for everyone because um, up to now, there aren't that much of a, a standard 
for everyone to follow and define what's right and what's wrong. So Marcus, um, how would you share with everyone uh, a way to figure out proper standards to teach? Would it be from being around foot volley? Would it be a combination of academics and being involved in the sport? Is it learning from another sport? How have you gone about that, understanding that there aren't that ma many uh, resources for you to learn from? So a lot of it has to be from experience. Yes, uh, I mean, it's hard to teach anything if you have different levels of people, like age and level of under how they understand the game, how they play their technique. But you first of all need to bring some happiness to what you're doing. You must love what you do. And creating this uh, place to, to teach is much easier. <coughs> But what I like to do is to separate levels. So when you have same people playing together, they can enjoy more. And um, like technique is about repetition so if you don't give them a proper way to practice and a safe place where they can uh, repeat and repeat over again they would never learn as fast as you want so let's consider let's consider somebody that's out uh, in africa or asia and they have a group of people that want to learn foot volley but they have no information they have maybe yeah. a ball maybe a net What should they do? That's a big question mark. What's the right proper steps to take? What would you uh, recommend them? I, I would recommend they, uh, them to play anywhere they can. Over a fence, over uh, a goal, over a bench. They should try to, to, to begin anyway. It doesn't matter if they have sand or beach. Uh, put volley... Uh, It's a huge sport around the world, but we know that nowadays we don't have that uh, that amount of courts of, of possibility for other people to play. But I would tell them to play Alchinha, to play against a wall, and to try to learn uh, some technique. And unfortunately, we don't have a book of football or an official video. We have plans for the future, but it's hard to, to, to look for information. And when I was in college, for example, I was uh, writing my papers to finish, to finish the graduation. And I couldn't find anything at the Internet. So it's hard to, to develop a serious uh, uh, work with foot volley where you understand everything from the bottom to the top and... With this, you can teach people. It's hard. So here we have in Brazil, uh, former players, uh, uh, people that don't play anymore and coach, people that coach and play at the same time. We have people that went to, to college like me to learn more about sports and psychology and other things to teach. But we don't have a program itself to help people, to guide people. So... Like now is much more important if you play it, the experience you have by playing it. And like it's, it's meaningful for teaching, but I hope that in the future it won't be that necessary that we could create some foot volley instructors. Like, for example, football. You have uh, some very good coaches around the world, like Parreira here in Brazil. He never played football. <laughs> And he was a world champion in 1994. So, I mean, yeah. Então, só para passar aqui para o pessoal que não domina o, o inglês, mas o Marquinhos está mencionando um pouco aqui de qual a percepção dele sobre uh, o cenário atual em relação à metodologia de ensinamento, que todos sabemos que ainda não existe um padrão uh, de como ensinar o esporte. Então, vem muito de um de uma combinação de preparação acadêmica, as pessoas que são formadas para entender todo, todos os aspectos de passo a passo para poder ensinar diferentes tipos de pessoas. Uh, e também hoje as pessoas que ensinam dependem muito de estar inserida no meio do esporte num aspecto de competição. 
né? Você precisa ter praticado alguns anos ou, de alguma forma, está muito próximo da prática por um bom tempo para poder integrar o teu conhecimento técnico, acadêmico, com o teu conhecimento, tua experiência do esporte em si. Porque o mundo ideal, que é como o futebol, é, ele colocou até um exemplo do Parreira, você normalmente tem um programa de capacitação de treinadores que você precisa fazer diversos cursos para conseguir tirar uma certificação e isso aí você está uh, habilitado a ser um grande treinador sem necessariamente ter vindo da prática do esporte no aspecto competitivo. Esse aí foi um exemplo que ele deu do Parreira, que o Parreira nunca foi um jogador de futebol. Não vou nem comprovar isso aqui, isso é um entendimento seu, tá? porque eu nunca fiz essa pesquisa. É o caso mesmo? É. Mas foi um campeão mundial. Então esse é um exemplo bem interessante de se considerar. Fechado? O pessoal é. deve ter entendido a explicação. Se não for no inglês, foi no português. Uh, so, moving on to our next topic. Um, still under methodology, I have two topics here. Um, how can we learn from other sports? Uh, there's a lot of sports that implement different strategies. Um, I come from tennis, and I know there's tons of different programs for kids to learn tennis and for people to begin in tennis that are completely different than the actual game version, competing uh, a match. So how can we learn from other sports? What sport would they be? Um, I'm assuming beach volleyball will be a big, uh, a big plus for us to get as much information as possible. And then um, on top of that, from your experience being a coach, what are the main characteristics for a good coach? Uh, the sports that are main related to football, in my opinion, are beach volleyball and soccer or beach soccer but first beach volleyball people found it funny because they think usually that it's soccer because of the ball and that you kick the ball but the understanding of the dynamic of the game how it works to pass it forward wait for the setting and how to defend the space are much more related to beach volleyball in my opinion than uh, than soccer, football. Uh, I always prefer to teach like beginners when they came from volleyball instead of soccer, of course. And, uh, each of them has their own, uh, they're gonna have more facility playing with the foot or whatever, but the understanding of the game, how to defend the standing on the proper position. And positioning for, on the court. Yeah, positioning on the court, it means a lot. Uh, but about uh, strategies to beginners, uh, it's very different from every other sport because football is played on the sand, so it's a uh, difficult surface itself. So for the beginners, it's not that easy. Not much people are used to play on the sand. And the net is too high for beginners, like kids, for example. So we have to adapt use a lighter ball for them, maybe a volleyball, uh, which is lighter, and uh, bringing also, the net Yeah, Also, talking, down. playing a different surface is a big aspect, yeah. especially because in many countries, the beach culture people have in Brazil, especially in Rio, they, mm -hmm. they are not common to other nations, correct? Yes, right, true. And we can play on the park, on the grass, on a uh, hard surface. I played a lot in a tennis court, you know, m having fun with friends. Yeah. Only using the service area to, to enjoy, you know, and it was fun. Football anyway. tennis. Football tennis is a great way to some, for somebody to start getting their, next, their first steps into football, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. By the way, uh, Paraguay, uh, the way they start is actually... I mean, it's never on sand because, as we know, they play on hard, on a hard floor. Mm -hmm. But they start with kids playing um, no no net. It's just a rope between two trees, and they let yeah. the ball bounce. So it's more like football tennis than than um, than even volleyball because the ball ball bounces, and and yeah. you see the results. They're the only country yeah. right now that really, I mean, not the only country, one of the few countries that right now plays face-to-face uh, -face against Brazil. And, I mean, making it simple for the first steps 
is mm -hmm. a big evolution for the sport, no, no doubt. Uh, yeah. The one, the other part. Go ahead. I I use this uh, strategy on schools already here in Rio, where for the beginners, I realize that letting the ball bounce first sometimes, like if they could, it would help. So the ball could bounce only once. Yeah. So you know, for people like around 12, 14 years old, for them, the first uh, uh, contact with football was this way and it helped a lot. But on the sand, we cannot use this, you know. So you yeah. have to create strategies where you start from uh, like baby, baby steps, like easy. You throw the ball to them, they repeat, they get confident, they feel safe like touching the ball with the forehead. And maybe it and could even be the case mm -hmm. that uh, for certain ages, people shouldn't even consider kids playing on sand. Maybe they're yeah. not developed enough. It could be the case that in, up until, say, 12 years old or 12 to 14, they have to play on a volleyball court, on a hard, mm -hmm. hard court so the ball can bounce. They have more ease, you know, moving around, which we understand the sand is a big challenge in football. Yeah, no doubt. Some people, some people come to me at the beach sometimes and ask, like, look, this is my children. Uh, this is my kid. Uh, she or he loves uh, football. She uh, watches football all the time. Can she play? And, I mean, if they are not, even when they are 12, if they are not uh, big enough, like the formation on, on the neck, the bones here, they, they need to be stabilized for the... It's a heavy ball, so if they touch too many times with the head, it won't be good for their neck and, you know, they're still growing. So that's why they need uh, to adapt and have it with the lighter yeah. ball. And even though you cannot repeat, uh, repeat so uh, much times the same movement, you, I mean, you have to create a, a, a fun, a fun training yeah. where they learn and they start loving the sport at the first time. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, and just to finish this up, that's uh, Pedro, a friend of mine. He is asking, "What's the age for starting foot volley?" Uh, it's because he has he's gonna have a, a son right now, Valentin. So he's wondering when he still he has will a few start. years waiting. Yeah, in like ten years, if he learns from you, Pedro. Yeah. <laughs> Desse último ponto que o, o Marcos comentou, a gente estava falando sobre uh, os esportes que são mais próximos da realidade do futebol, quando a gente está falando de, de dinâmica de treino e de ideias para exercícios. É, o vôlei de praia, sem sombra de dúvidas, é um esporte muito mais próximo da realidade do futebol no quesito treinamento. E se a gente tinha alguma coisa para aprender e para tirar proveito, seria da dinâmica de treino de vôlei de praia. E também a gente falou um pouquinho da idade, que mencionou que 10, 12 anos, mais para 12 anos seria a idade ideal para uma criança estar começando. E todos os aspectos em relação à repetição de bola de cabeça, que não pode ser uma coisa muito... Uh, uh, durar por muito tempo, porque a criança pode acabar tendo algum tipo de problema no pescoço, algo do tipo. E também a gente precisa ser muito cuidadoso, porque quando a criança ou uh, um jovem adolescente está iniciando no esporte e a gente tem que priorizar essa, essa molecada a se divertir. E não é tanto uma questão de evoluir a técnica. Num primeiro momento é mais a questão de, de curtir a atividade do que, do que aprender em, especificamente a técnica. Estão brincando contigo aí, hein? não ri não. Minha Pode rir. Pessoal falando, falando que eu tô velho aqui, pô. Que isso? <risos> é muita experiência, pô. É, meu aluno... Okay, so just to finish up this topic, uh, what would you say are the main qualities for a good coach in foot volley? What are the, let's say, the three things that somebody needs to have to eventually be a, an effective coach? Uh, patience. Okay, that's one. Patient. And number three, patience. He has to be patient all the time because uh, you need that, you know, you're going to have... Uh, uh, different people around you, they're gonna, uh, they have different timings, they have different, uh, uh, like, they, they want different things. Some of them want to learn in one week, 
Some of them are too angry when they miss, and they miss a lot. And you have to to be calm around them, give them uh, confidence, and be patient again because it takes time. It's not an easy sport where you play two, three times and you are like having that much of fun. It's not that easy. Uh, so you have to be patient. It's the the main thing that I, I would uh, I would tell. And okay. uh, and always be positive. I think always be like pushing them to feel that they're improving. Yeah, yeah a lot, a lot, and and give uh, the the players, the people uh, that are learning from you, the opportunity to to have fun and enjoy the game because what you learn first is to have fun <laughs> with the game and not the other things like you know winning and other stuff so the main thing is the most fun. simple the more simple the yeah, better the simple yeah uh, more simple better okay so uh ron apologize but we're still in the beginning we only spoke about marcus introduction He's been coaching foot volley for 10 years and is one of the few guys that uh, we have connected along the years and helped us out doing some, some, some stuff with the kids, um, some uh, promotions, and uh, somebody that we have a lot of respect for. Um, and we just spoke about different things within uh, training methodology, standards, developing a program, uh, what are the good traits of a coach, uh, what, what we can learn from other sports, and things of that nature. But um, once we're done, just give it a few minutes and you can watch it in the beginning. But that's all we've spoken so far, ok? Moving on, uh, passando para o próximo tema, vamos falar de perfil de alunos. Moving on to different profiles. Uh, we've spoken a lot about this, uh, myself and Marcus. But in football, uh, especially in Brazil, that you have a lot of people involved. Uh, people of all kinds get involved. Some of them get involved to lose weight, to look to lose weight, other people involved, get involved to socialize, other people get involved because they want to become professionals. Uh, there's different focuses. So maybe, uh, Marcus, if you can elaborate a little bit more about identifying uh, what's the objective of uh, your students and adapting your coaching style so that you can uh, follow the direction of the student and not trying to go too much on somebody that maybe just wants to, you know, do some activity, have fun. Right. Uh, first, if you can, and like once you understand which kind of people are you dealing with, like if they are, uh, <clears throat> of course, you ask, like, what are you here for? Do you want to become professional? Do you want to lose weight? Do you want to make new friends? But uh, if you can, first of all, you try to uh, create different groups, you know, because when you have these different groups, they have the best scenar scenario to, to learn. So if you have only beginners, you can work a lot on the technique, like half of the time you have repeating, repeating, like they have to play 50 touches on every uh, aspect of their game, like shoulder, head, foot, attack, receiving, setting, and then you try to, to, to create a game situation, a game, a game plan, like. But uh, if you can't, you should create strategies on your, uh, on your um, uh, course, on your, yeah, to help them. So I always start, like, if I have a beginner that can only play safe with the, the head, for example, I would throw the ball first to him so this person could set the ball and this is how the the training would start, you know? Like, I would uh, not ask them to try something unusual, like set with your left or uh, do something very hard for them. So always bring them uh, something uh, easy, you know? But when you have different uh, uh, levels, so for example, have uh, on two, four people on the court, one which is good helping uh, beginner, you know, on their side. So I throw 
a harder ball for the and, uh, best player, and I throw an easy ball for the worst player. And by doing this and repeating, the the worst people on the court will learn and will get confident enough to improve. And of course, some of the times you can throw a hard ball on them and to see what happens. But most uh, effective way, in my opinion, is to to start with easy and not pushing too much at the beginning because people start foot volley very easy. A lot of people come to learn, beginner, they want to try, but they quit very uh, easy too if you don't bring them this, uh, this uh, safe place for, for learn, you know. But do you have any sort of, uh, let's say, interview process to understand what's the focus of that person, especially when it comes to an adult? If you have somebody mm -hmm. that's maybe 20 years old, 25 years old, maybe the person just wants to have fun. Or maybe the person wants to take it serious. Do you do some sort of yeah. uh, interviewing process so you can adapt uh, that person to a different training style or a different group? Or you just yeah. wait for them to perform and then after you figure out how to move them around? No, I, I do interview them from... Uh, with WhatsApp, Instagram, or personally. I ask them if they play already. I ask them which uh, uh, <clears throat> sports they played before. I ask them if they have any injury uh, uh, past, like if they have something on the knee and whatever, because this is very important too. And then I try to separate them. And like here in Rio, Uh, thank God I'm busy with my groups. And when I have uh, uh, a person that their best time to practice doesn't match my time or the group that I would tell them to practice, I said to them, hey, sorry, I would not put you on a situation where you're going to practice with an uh, uh, advanced group or when I only can offer you a beginner class. So I uh, give them the contact of Black and LeBlanc, Leo Lindoso, and other uh, coaches around Rio because they are uh, very good also. And I mean, they can have a, a, a good place and a, a to practice. So ultimately, the most important part here is separating groups by technical level, by age, by gender, by age. so that everyone that's within that training group has somewhat of a similar level. Uh, no, sorry. Before uh, 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 before you ask it, I want to say something. And some people here come to me, like, I want to learn foot volley to play Altinha. <laughs> I laugh <laughs> first, but yeah, it happens, you know, like... Uh, Is it, isn't it supposed to... to be the opposite? Yeah, it's supposed to be, but some people, like, so I understand that Somehow they just want to have fun, you know, at the end. They just want to have fun. So, yeah, it, it, it happens a lot here in Rio because our chain is also big here. I see there's a, there's a long conversation going on here between Russian football, Ron Benishai, uh, Daniel. I mean, you guys are more than welcome to make a private WhatsApp group and have your chat there. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few questions here. How hard is it? to elaborate collective training to different people? Uh, how hard is it to elaborate collective training to different people? I'm assuming separating the, the levels. I can't, it, do, do you have a challenge uh, making sure that people that are in different groups, they're all within the same level, or sometimes you, you're obligated to mix them up or you completely avoid that? No, I I do both. I do both. Like when I have uh, uh, different levels on the court, uh, I I like to mix uh, good and good players and beginners so they can uh, help and help me. Sometimes I do practice with them. So sometimes I take a beginner and we play against two intermediate players. So which is good. So I we help them, and uh, but 
like but ideally it's better to keep people yeah, separate in, in their own level so that everyone grows yeah, together sometimes, sometimes you can't so what do i suggest to have more balls like so then you can always uh, keep uh, people that are waiting busy doing some exercises outside and like uh, they they will feel it somehow during the training and and they will understand but it takes time it takes time it's not easy there's an interesting question there from Greece what's the biggest number of players that you put in a beginner group is it different from intermediate do you always do a certain number of players that regardless of what's the level or maybe you can have more players if it's beginners or maybe more players if it's a different level what's the right number yeah when i work by myself um i always like to have like intermediately uh, intermediate now yeah. eight, eight people so we have four teams so when you have one hour of practice it's like it's a lot they get tired tired easy and but beginners without help only me on the court i would take four six maximum because they need more attention like and they and they and they miss a lot the ball so you need to repeat repeat and repeat all the time but like uh i do this all the time when i have uh, like people that are uh serve against each other and i only stay by the side talking tactics and what they should do how they should react how they should wait for the ball they are going to deep to to receive the ball they are waiting too much so i i also uh, like to to have more game gameplay you know gameplay a lot so would you say that for a beginner level uh you should have less players you should have eight players what's yeah, the we, a better level you can have more players uh worse level you you should so you can give them more attention them. yeah they need so more say attention four to eight would be the number if it's lower mm -hmm. level it's more closer to four if it's higher level you don't have to be so much on top of them it could be around eight yeah. right right i have right. a question, question here too that does i don't know why it's not showing there but it's a gi giga vba what are the biggest challenges for the game to evolve around the world? I mean, I think we can get to that as we move along. Hopefully, it's still going to be on the conversation. But uh, let's move to these questions here on our conversation. So the first one we had was from Greece, from Football Athens. Russian football, is it good to play and train tech ball the same time that you're training football? I think it's different. And the technique is different. What do you feel that you play both sports? Uh, tech ball, you play with a lighter ball. And you use a lot your your foot. And the technique is more... How can I say? Apurada, Luis. Refined. Uh, refined. refined. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, you have less space, and, right? To hit the ball. So you have to be very specific. Yeah, it's a smaller space. Thing. But uh, at the same time, the net is lower, so you can you don't have to jump all the time to attack. And maybe maybe like, helps with the technique, but definitely not with I mean, tactics. Yeah, uh, you have you have you have to switch to play uh, these two because also the tactics of how you move on the court, how you defend short balls are are different, but. I would I would never uh, uh, win the world champion with Natalia, the championship with Natalia, if it wasn't football in my life. So it helped me a lot, of course. Um, there's a question here from Ron regarding high level competition, high level players. Um, how? What's the best way for them to learn uh, the best tactics? I think it's a lot to do with the team they're playing against. Yeah, no, like. When you play, when you talk about high-level players like Ron and the guys that play uh, international tournaments, level, yeah, professional tournaments, you have to to adapt all the time and 
during the game and when you play against different people and you cannot do the same thing like you cannot take one strategy for the first game and like bringing it to the final only if you are the like the best team in the world when you have such a power game that you impose your game on other teams but like when you're struggling like to win you have to tournaments learn your you opponents to, yeah you have to i don't like to say read but you have to understand your opponent which are their best balls when they try their best balls would be like a match point against or important point during uh, the game like when it's like tied in 10-10 so uh perfect my main uh, uh advice would be uh be flexible like learn to 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 adapt. move around the court adapt and move and like uh, the most thing that like I found it about uh, players from Europe, for example, like I, I train them sometimes, like like Mo. I could say like Mo or or, or, or Joel, Joel. From, uh, Joel from Germany. They are very very strong. They attack hard, but defending is the main issue for them. So they like. They don't. They are positioning on the court. You say positioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cannot do the same like a goalkeeper. You cannot uh, stay on the center of the goal trying to defend a penalty against Cristiano Ronaldo. Like you have to move. You have to learn, and you have to uh, watch games, a lot of games from him to understand where he wants to to uh, to send the ball. You know. Yeah. And, perfect. We had a question from a uh, Russian footballer, which is regarding uh, what's the right online program for people to learn. Um, that's still not available. There are some players that have made some courses available, but it's their own opinion on how uh, football needs to be coached. No one's saying it's right or wrong, but it's not, let's say, the, the, the unified standard for how uh, football needs to be coached because that's still – not not something that exists and hopefully over time we can uh, uh incorporate something of this nature talking with players talking with different coaches and and putting together what will be the ideal program because there's many different things to be considered especially uh, the circumstances of other countries we have to mm -hmm. consider that when we put together a training methodology because not everyone is living under the same circumstances as Rio de Janeiro, where everyone plays sports on the beach, there's tons of coaches, everyone is playing in different, under different circumstances, and that needs to be considered if we want to make a standard. Luiz, oh, I yeah. have a good question, a good question here from Roberto. Uh, a player that already have a favorite side to play, uh, do you suggest him to play sometimes on his bad side of the court, or do you think this is not good for him? Uh, I would advise to play as much as you can on your best side, on your worst side, because imagine this situation. Here in Rio, for example, it happens a lot when you have four players from the left. What to do? It happens have a, a lot. Bad, have a bad game. And like it's fun because when you have uh, uh, four good players on the left, no ones want to play on the right because they don't want to look bad, you know, on the picture. So yeah. we have to call. We have to call people. Hey, do you want to play? Wait, first, <laughs> which side do you play? Right or left? Oh, right. You can come. Yeah, it's so an interesting it's, topic. Yeah, it's funny though. But you, you, I, I would advise now seriously to play as much as you can. Bad people around you, not bad people, but beginners, uh, old people your girlfriend try on, to play on the opposite side on the opposite side of course because like imagine that you attack a very good ball on your parallel okay if you play on the on the opposite side you're going to have a good short diagonal as well you just have to adapt and by doing so you're going to understand uh, uh, the struggling of the two sides of the court and how to move and like You're gonna you're gonna feel it better. 
from your experience and from your academic background, uh, understanding how our body works, why do you think there's so much impact when you play on the side that you're not used to? Why is it that you feel that everything looks different when you play on the opposite side? Because I've played before, and when you play on a side that you're not used to, that's what happens. Uh, attacking is different. Defending is different. Setting is different. It's like it looks like you're blind, right? Yeah. Why is that? Is that because of your sight, uh, because of your understanding of your surroundings? Why do you feel that, that we feel like that? Uh, like, uh, it's a good question. Like, every part of like, us, we, every side, we can have a dominant uh, uh, part. Like uh, Homari, for example, is right-footed and left hand to right. But we uh, see better with one eye than the other. We hear better with, like, depends on. And on the side that you play also, because uh, especially people that don't have, like, both shoulders, don't play with a neutral uh, technique, chest. which is the chest, they struggle a lot to play uh, on the opposite side. But... Uh, like also when you are used to defend the long ball in the middle with the right, you're gonna defend with the chilena or with the left. So, but when you disturb this, like when you don't feel comfortable enough, and after a few games or after a few years, you realize you realize that uh, you can still play because like you, you became from level A to level B, like just changing the side. And when you can play somehow good on both, you're going to improve also on your best side. Okay, so fair enough. Uh, moving on from uh, this very uh, entertaining topic, moving on to another one, which is, uh, I mean, there's a question here about Paraguayan style. Uh, I think we have to maybe stay focused on training. Maybe we can answer that in uh, the end. Uh, wait, wait. Uh, we are moving forward? Yes, we're or... moving to another topic. Why? Did uh, you okay. have something? No, uh, I, I saw a, a, a question about the Paraguayan style of play. Yeah, it's just that we, if we start talking about other topics, then we're not going to talk yeah, about training. Okay, we, we talk about this after. We'll try to talk about this in the end, okay? Um, plano de treino. So putting together a training program, understanding how to separate the time, um, how to focus uh, more on, on the technical part over tactical, depending on your focus group. So how do, you, how do you work around this? How do you separate the time depending on your groups? You mentioned you have different groups, beginner, intermediate, advanced. How does somebody that's trying to improve in coaching how can they separate their time? Because let's, let's, put, let's put it as an example, a one-hour training. That's what normally is for any place in the world, especially for mm -hmm. beginners. Um, how do you work around that depending on the level? Uh, here, uh, I change it a little bit. I, I start uh, every day 6 a.m., and I finished the first class uh, 7.15. So I have one hour and 15. And I tell people that these 15 minutes, I do what I want, okay? And the other one hour, we can discuss what we do. Uh, but like, I always start warming up. They move like when it's too early, they have to, you know, wake, wake up. up. <laughs> wake up first, you know? And like, I let them warm up jogging, like they have five minutes to do whatever they want. And Jogger after- around the court? Yeah, around the court, like free. They are free to move, swinging arms and do whatever they like to do. And when they come back to me, uh, like we start waking up their body, like especially the foot, you know? So the, what about do... stretching? You do stretching after? Is there stretching no, before? I don't, I don't do stretchings much. I don't do stretch uh, before because uh, when you're playing on the sand, you use power. And when you stretch a muscle that it's in in few minutes, it's about to contract and make power. I don't feel like, like 
helps a lot, you know, it somehow can make it loose, you know. So I prefer them to be warm before we start for real. So okay. when they start sweat, they are ready to do. Like I won't, I would never start with the shoulder, or uh, sorry, the chest, like the first so technique that we start. So always foot, shoulder, head, and then when they are warm enough, chest. And then we start uh, with the. I, I always choose how long, a topic. How long does that last? Ten minutes. Ten, fifteen minutes. How do you split? How do you split between each technique? So you just mentioned four: foot, shoulder, head, and one more, or just three. So both it's five, five minutes each. Yeah, both shoulders, head, and uh, uh, foot, and both foot, both okay. feet. And after I choose a topic on every training, like, like for example, today is the International Day of Settings. So we practice like settings from all over the place. So we, we try settings with the left shoulder close to the net. We have uh, settings far from the net using the right foot. And by doing so and repeating a lot, I, uh, I think that the players, they start feeling the rhythm of setting balls, which is different. There's a different timing, like when you set a ball closer to the net with your partner uh, around you, you don't have to set it that high. But when you're far away from the net, of course, you need to give him more time to adjust and attack. But they only get it when they repeat and when they try from different angles. And, and that's it. I always choose a topic. And then on the other day, I choose like receiving. So, so I start. So just, just to clarify what you mentioned for people that may, may not have understood. People start off, they warm up. Five minutes, free, maybe whoever wants to do a little bit, a little different, mm -hmm. decide some sort of activity that's fun that they can do to warm up without having to actually train. So mm -hmm. after that, you do five minutes of each technique separating foot, both feet, shoulders, both shoulders, head, not both heads, just one head, and, mm -hmm. uh, and then you leave chest for last, correct? Mm -hmm. So five minutes each, we have 25 minutes. There's uh, another 35 minutes for the hour. Um, then how much of that do you focus on the topic of the day? 15 minutes, 20 minutes? The what, what would you say in average? The rest uh, of the, the time, us? Yes. So I, I go, I, I, I improve, like, every 10 minutes, the difficult of the game. And, like, the last 10 minutes only, or the last five minutes, uh, I, I do some services, because if, like, they play, they must learn it. And uh, I try to adapt easy service for the beginners, and when they are, they can handle a service, I throw the ball from my hands towards them in a easy way they could defend. Yeah. So pretty much is the technical aspect. After that, you have a topic of the day, which could be defending, mm -hmm. it could be attacking, it could be setting. Um, yeah. And then towards the very end, you have something that's closer to a game. Depending on the level, yeah. you're more involved throwing the ball with the hand. They play uh, one touch or two touch. And uh, you try to be involved in the game as much as possible. And when it's not the case, you just have them have some free play before the training mm -hmm. is over. And then what about mm -hmm. that last part that you mentioned? It's your time, the 15 minutes, the special 15 minutes. No, I, I, use, it, I use it on the middle. I use it at the end. Like, depends okay. on how the train, the, the train is going. Do you add but... some physical component to, uh, to your training? Or depends on the level? Or you, people are tired enough just by training? The tactical yeah. part. Uh, most of the times, like I, I bring it, I, I bring it a, a good dynamic for the training, so they can they can get tired only by doing this. But sometimes, of course, when I have uh, uh, good players and when they are fit, I I bring some jumping side the court or some other exercise like squatting or 
So mm -hmm. just just simplifying the entire topic, would you say that for beginners, the focus is a lot more on only technique, making it as fun as possible, forget tactics, yeah. forget playing points. It's more about having no. fun with the game. For a 12-year-old yeah. kid, we can have a full point. Yeah, they can have a full point. So, but always, when I can, I, I, I tell them like something about tactics, what they're gonna, I, I, I show them some little. future. Yeah, yeah, a little, a little. So, uh, when we reach there, uh, there, they know. Ah, you told you told us about this like two weeks ago. Now we are here. And so, then when they move to intermediates. They, Then yeah. there's more tactics. There's more like, oh, this boy, you have to go in, you have to cover the middle, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Because if not, it's too much information for a beginner. Correct? Yeah, no, no. You, can't, you, know, you cannot give them all like yeah. in the first class because they, they would not swallow. Like. Obviously, it depends on commitment. But how long do you feel traditionally people last to move from one level to the other? Maybe three months? In average, obviously, that changes. Yeah, in average, it is um, after three months, like they reach a plateau where they stay like for one month, two months. Sometimes they stay longer, like to to go to advanced level. And if they persist, they can uh, uh, improve again. Like it, you you don't go like jumping like uh, jujitsu, like have that uh, sort of uh, qualification. Belt. Maybe yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, um, around that level of those levels of training, where do you feel is the ideal for you to actually introduce a regular version of the game, serving, receiving? Would you say that uh, maybe towards the end of the intermediate level is when they should start trying to play points, two versus two, a full regular game um, or it could be a little bit before I, li I like to introduce uh, during the training uh, like the full game like where I serve or where they serve against each other because this is how the game works I don't uh, I don't like to I like I like to do it sometimes like a training a game And when they feel comfortable chesting or using the shoulders, it's a good uh, sign that they they can try to receive. Because when they only can header or use the feet or tie, it's not the best way to to start. Like you jumping uh, too much forward. You know? But would you feel that uh, ideally somebody to start playing points, regular points, two versus two, with somebody serving with the foot and having nobody helping, would you say that's ideal for somebody that's beginning, maybe under three months or under, yeah, those, but... under that time, it's better to have the coach in the court helping out, holding the ball with the hand, throwing to the other side? Yeah. Yes, yes. And again, the, the good sign that you can serve on someone is when they can receive the ball somehow with the shoulder but of course or chest that i was throwing it a lot of balls before like closer to the net because uh, when you jump like as uh, stages of the game it's like uh, you increase your chances to lose to lose yes. the, the person also Yeah, and, and I don't want to teach someone that, you know, have a, a gap on their foot volley, like, oh, I don't play my shoulder, or I didn't learn this, I didn't... I try to bring the full, you no, know, the full thing, but giving them the opportunity to learn okay, at the right time. So Ron is asking, on the beginner level, do you feel there are a few information that you can share regarding how to move on the court, how to position... Or you you save that for a later stage. I think you no, briefly no. mentioned a little bit of that. What? How much information can you give to a beginner? Because there's a yes. lot of information. Yeah, depends on depend depends on uh, how much and what they played before uh, foot volley. Like, if I uh, uh, bring someone from like capoeira or a dancing thing or whatever. They don't understand 
how to react and how to wait for the ball properly. And, the and where to position distance, also. The position of the body, the athletic position, the position that you stay on the octagon, like on uh, fighting on the UFC. Waiting for the best, but expecting the worst, you know? Lee, how are you, my friend? Oi, nem percebi aqui a hora, hein? É, deu uma hora, né? Tá passando rápido. Mm -hmm. Lee, so we're talking to Marcos. Marcos is a great coach uh, from Rio. He's been coaching for over 10 years and we're sharing a lot of different insights about uh, coaching plan, coaching strategy, different levels, just sharing his opinion about how things should be done. And, okay, so where were we last? Uh, we we're talking about the training program and Ron had asked a question about how much information to give to a beginner. And um, yeah. I think it's primarily like what you said, it depends on um, how much you see the beginner improving and how much he knows about mm -hmm. the sport Mark. yes i understand he's a beginner but maybe he came from beach volleyball maybe he already knows yeah. the positioning but uh, marcus had mentioned before that it's important for you to not put too much information in a beginner level he mentioned previously that you can share some hints about what's coming regarding tactics but don't expect the beginner to follow every single step of tactics it's more about focusing on the technical aspects Getting comfortable with the foot, getting comfortable with the shoulder, understanding what to do with the head, not so much of where to be on the court, how to move, how to attack, where to position for defending. That would be a next step, uh, responding mm -hmm. to Ron's question. All but right. Like some, some of the things like I, I don't let them do, like just because it's easier at the beginning, like using the top of your foot a lot. It's easier, like, you kick the ball, the ball go up. But I tell them, like, look, this is easier now, but it's much harder to, to fix a ball or to, to give your partner a good setting, a good pass. So I tell them, yeah, you can do it for today, but try to move around and feel like playing with both feet because now it's worse, but... When you learn it, you're gonna say thanks. Só dando uma geral aqui, uh, o Marcos acabou de compartilhar duas questões em relação a treino para a molecada que está aprendendo ou até mesmo adolescentes e adultos que estão aprendendo. É, a gente tem que manter as informações o mais simples possível, focando, uh, dando prioridade na parte técnica, focando muito na pessoa ter mais conforto com o pé, ter mais conforto aprendendo... Uh, um básico da, da parte de peito, de ombro, um pouco de cabeça, principalmente se não for uma criança muito jovem, não pode forçar muito em bola de cabeça. E um detalhezinho adicional que ele passou aqui é que as pessoas, quando estão começando, elas têm a tendência de usar o peito do pé. E isso é uma coisa que é bastante importante evitar. Correto? Correto. Concede? So, moving on, uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to share, but uh, we're getting to the last topics of the conversation. Fernandito Lugo, como estás, hermano? Estamos hablando de entrenamiento, ¿sabes? Huh? Oh, crack, hey. Después él tiene que ensinar para dar a quebradinha de cabeza. Como é que ensina eso? Boa. Esa ahí no se ensina, no, en la escuela de Marquinhos, se ensina. Ensina, ensina. Só tem que aprender, tem que aprender a andar para depois correr, né? So, yeah, Fernando, uh, Chorei just kind of came on the, the, the stream and uh, we're just discussing about how can somebody learn what they do with the head. And Marcus said that it takes time. First, you have to learn the basics and then you start talking about doing uh, some tricks with the head like the Paraguayans. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes... And most of the times you would never learn. <laughs> yeah, it's something very specific. I think a few players yeah. are learning already. Some international players yeah. are learning. Okay, so 
moving on. Okay, I, I had one more question regarding uh, the training aspects. When do you feel your players should be ready to compete? Because I see a lot of uh, tournaments out there, especially in Brazil, uh, with different levels, beginner level, intermediate level. And uh, I don't know, is it positive for players to be playing at a beginner level? Is it, uh, it going to be maybe too intimidating? They're going to feel like, oh, the sport is not for me. Do you think that they should wait a little bit and train more before they start competing? Yeah, like I don't remember when was the uh, the time that I said to some of my players like, look, now it's the time for you to compete. They come to me like asking before and asking to prepare them for the first tournament of their lives or something like this. So then when I feel this this wish on them, I help them, of course. But... Uh, it's a competitive uh, 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 side of the game that uh, most of the people that are beginning don't realize it, and it's it's difficult. It's difficult to to have your first tournament. You like, I think that you won't win on the first tournament. I don't know who won on the first tournament, but um, yeah. It's 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 also nice to see like when you have I, I did it like a lot of times when somebody started with me from zero and like when they start playing tournaments and having fun and walking around with football jerseys and you know it's like it's nice to see that you change some someone's life like like this. Ok, thank you, perfect. Uh, Ellington entrou aí, se quiser dar um alô. Quem? Ellington. Ah, fala Tom. Fenômeno. Oh, joga I muito. do speak with you in English. Ele joga tudo, né? Que isso. É verdade. Ele quer jogar de tech ball agora. Deu ruim para mim. Multiatleta. É, passando para o próximo tema, um dos dois últimos aqui. Jogo adaptado e variações. Né? A gente sabe que o, o futebol tem diversas variações. Vamos falar um pouquinho disso. So, moving on to our next topic, uh, we're going to talk about different variations of football, how we can adapt and take advantage of different uh, activities that are part of the football ecosystem. Altinha, uh, futimesa, tech ball, uh, playing football on a tennis court, playing football on a mini net. Um, so, just having an overall understanding on how these sports can help getting a lot more people interested and getting a first step into foot volley. Uh, what do you, how do you feel that these sports can help more people get involved indirectly into foot volley and eventually uh, getting more motivated to move on to foot volley? Yeah. Uh, the beginning, you should try to play uh, with your friends and uh, whatever you, you can, like, Uh, on the garage, uh, on the park, on the garden, uh, over the table, over a rope, as you said, on a hard surface. And it helps a lot. Helps uh, to improve the technique. Uh, so when you go to learn on a escolinha or on a place or with me, or like you already know something, you are used to the ball. And if you don't think that foot volley will be your life, you're going to understand how difficult and you're going to give a, a, a better value like when you watch players uh, playing on a hard, on the top level. So I would advise people to try at least. It's fun. So try whatever you can. So yeah, there's uh, many different types of activities that are very similar to foot volley. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, without a doubt, uh, this needs to grow if we want to see football grow and people need to understand that they need to play a lot more of these other sports that all relate to football uh, if they want to improve their level, especially when they're beginning. Uh, we should say that these other activities are a much easier step for somebody to get to football, correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah. É, o Marquinhos estava compartilhando aqui a importância do, dos esportes que fazem parte, vamos dizer, da família do futebol, que é Altinha... Futimesa, Redinha, até mesmo Futitênis. Tem muita gente que joga o, 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 
como se fosse um futebol adaptado numa quadra de tênis. E todas, uhum. esses, todas essas atividades são fundamentais para que a gente veja o esporte crescer, porque todas elas são extremamente mais acessíveis para muita gente que não tem essa cultura de praia também. E elas são mais práticas, uhum. né? Muitas vezes a gente tem mais uh, facilidade de ter um parque próximo a você, que você consiga... Pode jogar, pode jogar um contra um também, não tem problema. Exatamente. Eu, eu, eu pô, jogava contra a parede, cara, você acredita? Ficava batendo bola com a parede. Sou filho único, ficava jogando sozinho. So, yeah, so if you're out there and uh, you don't have any beaches near you and uh, you feel that you, need, you can improve your level in football, there are many other ways for you to do it. You can go to a volleyball court. Uh, people in Russia do that very well. They play tons mm -hmm. of times in a volleyball court, especially because it's cold out there. So a lot of times they depend to play on some uh, indoor facility and not every nation has indoor beach courts, beach volleyball courts. Um, so it's, yeah, all these different uh, activities are very important for somebody that wants to eventually be at a high level in foot volley. Alchinha, Futimeza, tech ball, uh, mini net, Reginha, playing on a tennis court, um, playing at a park. You don't have to depend on the beach for you to get started into foot volley. That's the most important message. True, yeah, that's the message. True. Okay, so... Um, The other detail that I had here regarding uh, the training and different games, uh, regarding equipment, what would you say um, are ideal equipments for people to have if they want to share the knowledge and uh, teach people foot volley besides, obviously, uh, ball and the net? Uh, the equipment, like, for beginners... Uh... I don't use anything but the balls. Uh, like when they first get in the court, every exercise that I do, like even to warm up, I I tell them like jump the end the line on the end of the court, touch the net, come back, move sideways, move to the front again, jump, jump with your hands, touch the top of the net, move back, then. Uh, by doing this, they're going to understand how big is the court. People don't realize it, it but it's one, uh, 81 square meters. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's too much space to cover. So when I do this, they, they feel running on the court. I don't use cones because when I start with the techniques, because the only thing that matters is the ball. So they must be looking to the ball like, like a dog. I, I, I like to say it sometimes. Looking to the ball, go for the ball, and never take your eye from it. And like, if you use too much cones on the court, it looks pretty, you know? But people are, are afraid to step on the cone. Distraction. Or down to the, yeah. Like, I, want, I, I like a, a, a cleaner place where they only go for the ball. And if they go where I'm throwing, they are going to the right place already. Don't need the cones, you know? So yeah, it's the about cones are the... additional information for them to assimilate. Additional information, unnecessary information at the beginning. But I, I only use cones with advanced players. And most of the times I use to split the court. Like I use a cone on the side and tell them, look, you start defending from this deep on the court. you waiting too much on the end. Go forward. Now start defending. So I create a, a place where they feel uncomfortable sometimes. But inside the court, it's hard. Only on the warm-up. Uh, any additional equipment? Maybe for an advanced level? Something that they can carry for weight or uh, some I, bands? I like, I, like, I like some... Uh, obstacles where they have to jump i like uh some uh, sticks where they have to aim to attack but not not much things like easy simple keeping it simple is the best way to like people create uh, uh too much movements that they don't use it on foot volley so if they go back and forth quickly, move to the side and jump a lot, it's enough. So 
if you concentrate on improving these main attributes, attributes, you're gonna uh, uh, improve your player and improve their level of, of the game. So, que o Marquinhos passou aqui para o pessoal que não não está entendendo muito é a necessidade de equipamentos adicionais para você ensinar mais uma vez a opinião do Marcos. A gente não está falando aqui uhum. o que, que é o certo e o que, que é o errado, mas principalmente no nível iniciante, quanto mais informação você passar para a pessoa, mais você está dificultando o treino dela. Então ele evita muito é, o uso de cones, por exemplo. É, foca na bola. As pessoas têm que estar tá e única e exclusivamente pensando que o foco é a bola e não está desviando de algum cone. Sim, existem movimentos, ah, que né? podem ter movimentos para ser para serem seguidos e feitos, mas tem que ser uma coisa um pouco mais básica. E aí, quando você vai evoluindo para outro nível, sim, você começa a colocar alvos do outro lado da quadra, você coloca, começa a colocar, de repente, cones ah, na linha da quadra, não dentro da quadra, para a pessoa poder ter uma noção de distância de voltar daquela linha imaginária para poder passar para frente de novo. É, só que quanto menos você usar de equipamento, pra, principalmente na fase de iniciante, melhor. Procede? Correto? Corretíssimo. Finalizando, cenário atual. Como é que você está vendo aí esse cenário atual do Brasil? Crescimento gigante, academias, treinadores... É, nesse aspecto de treinamento, o que, que você acha que está acontecendo? Como pode ser feito melhor? So, current scenario in Brazil, Marcos is about to tell us what he feels about the, the, the growth that we've seen in the sport in Brazil right now. Uh, now, uh, especially here in Rio, that I follow more, there are plenty of places that you can learn uh, football where you can flex and uh, practice in a higher level as well. It improved a lot like since five years. So in Leblon you have four places. In Ipanema you have four, five places. Copacabana, Flamengo, Barra. Uh, and I think that around Brazil as well, like Goiânia, people at Bahia, Recife, So you have much more places to practice and you have much more information. But actually what uh, Mrs. I think that we missing? A, a need is something that we can put together all this good information, all this valuable information. And, and by doing this, we could uh, help the sport growing in a way more people like in Amazonas in other parts of Brazil and we can think the world could have access and try to, to teach their community you know so they could learn like of course Brazil sometimes is the number one in football sometimes we lose also uh, but I mean nobody played And nobody uh, tried the game more than us. Like so, if we could bring us also with the help of people from Europe, that I mean, they played a lot. Of course, they they research a lot about the game. We could organize an information where uh, people could share. Yeah. And and they would like learn and bring the information forward. Então, um pouquinho da, da opinião do Marquinhos. É, nos últimos anos, o esporte, todo mundo sabe, cresceu muito. Novas academias, novos clubes, novos treinadores. Mas a informação ainda está muito separada. né? Cada um tem sua opinião. E na opinião do Marquinhos, e a gente está 100% de acordo, no momento que haja um pouco mais de troca né? e uma, uma colaboração entre esses principais treinadores, é, pode sim ser criado uma referência para que a gente consiga ajudar o crescimento do esporte e compartilhar essa informação para que, que, que pessoas que não têm acesso a esse programa, a esse padrão, consigam replicar e não tenham que tentar deduzir de onde que ele tem que tirar a informação. Porque muito que acontece, que a gente conhece o pessoal de fora, eles vêm para o Brasil e não sabe direito onde treinar, não sabe uh, o que levar de volta, porque justamente eles não, não conhecem o que, que é o, o padrão 
a ser seguido. Certo? Certíssimo. E para a gente finalizar aqui, uh, no exterior, você que já teve em alguns países, já treinou atletas de outros países, o que, que você acha que está tá acontecendo? É, quais são as maiores dificuldades que o pessoal está passando? Uh, só dar um pouquinho da tua percepção em relação a isso. So regarding uh, the development of uh, the technical aspects of football on a training side, Marcos has coached different uh, teams, uh, has lived abroad for quite some time in different countries to share his knowledge and um, he can share with us a little bit of what his percep perception is uh, regarding football coaching outside of Brazil. Uh, I, I love to, to teach uh, people from Europe or all over the world, especially when they come to Rio because they are like the They want to practice all the time. They they are hungry to 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 learn, and I love this. I love this uh, atmosphere of training. And the main thing, like I, I I'm gonna use the example of the Austrian guys that they came to me, like the brothers. They play really good. They are really fit, and they they love the game. They have such a big passion about it. And I asked them, what, what do you think you have to improve on your game? They said, like, everything. No, no. Like, one thing that most of them, like, especially in Europe, struggle is on defending against good attackers. Because they, like, they feel like just waiting too much on the court. They don't move. They don't surprise But when I say surprise, it's not surprising like crazy, like running and moving. But as we, we, we were talking before, like understanding, closing spaces and, and moving. So the thing that they have to improve is sometime, sometimes I find them innocent, if I can say this word on, on the best way possible. Innocent defending. So they have to have more uh, uh, something on their head that they need to go and close gaps and leave other places like leave the long diagonal, leave, 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 go forward and not be being crazy moving and running, as I said. But, But uh, on the yeah. coaching side, uh, do you see any growth? Have you seen a new... Yeah new coaches in other countries, uh, actual foreign coaches, um, how much of that has grown from what you follow? Yeah, it, it grown uh, a lot, especially in Germany, for example. The guys from Germany, uh, like in the first years when they came to me, they were, uh, they, they wanted to learn how to play, how to improve. And now like last year, They wanted to learn how to teach, what to do with some situations like, hey, give me some plans, like let's have a breakfast right here. What we should do, I have only eight balls or I have uh, only one court, eight people. So, so you can see that it changed a lot from learning how to play and like after they start loving and having such a passion for football, they want to bring it forward and help and teach other people. So, I'm also, so, uh, so pre pretty much this generation that we know right now has a big job in their hands mm -hmm. because not yeah. only they have to perform as players, but it, it is up to them to get as much information as possible so they can share what they learn to other people from wherever they're from, right? And it's... They it's can a, bring it to the next level. They are responsible to bring the sport to the next level, like teaching more people, get more people involved, and show this amazing sport to the rest it's, of the It's a challenging topic because a lot of times these athletes, they want to perform, they want to compete. Uh, and on the other hand, maybe they have uh, a job, uh, maybe their profile is not a coaching profile, but... Yeah. Uh, a lot of times it's important for at least one or two of them to consider the possibility of taking maybe a day or two of the week to share what they've learned to other people from and their country. 
Uh, like there was a uh, seed, a guy from uh, Norway here, and he he told me like we only have three good people, and I said, come on, you have to teach the other four, <laughs> like. Because then you're gonna have a better uh, uh, training, you know. You cannot only play with three people, so you have to learn. So after he practiced, I was inviting him to help me, you know, on my 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 classes to learn how to teach people uh, on his country. É, só para finalizar aqui, então o último ponto que a gente mencionou é que os atletas que antigamente vinham para o Marquinhos e para outros treinadores no Rio para aprender a evoluir o nível de jogo, agora estão voltando para aprender a ensinar, o que é uma, é uma experiência bem interessante para vocês, né? Ah, porque é, um, é uma questão extremamente importante, fundamental para o esporte conseguir evoluir num, num âmbito internacional que o pessoal não foque só nele jogando, que eles possam vir aqui, adquirir, adquirir informação, aprender, melhorar o jogo deles e voltar para casa e compartilhar esse conhecimento para que outras pessoas não só aprendam a jogar, mas também aprendam a ensinar, né? porque esse tem que ser um efeito viral. Se todo mundo focar só em jogar, a gente não consegue crescer o esporte. Né? Tem que compartilhar Exato. o conhecimento. Certo? Quem ensina, aprende duas vezes também, tem isso, né? É, tem alguma perguntinha aqui? Três jogadores que você já ensinou. Three, co three players that you have already coached. Three top players. Ele quer confete, pô. Um é ele e os outros dois eu não vou arrumar a briga, não. Mas como ele perguntou, eu vou falar que ele tá entre os três. <risos> top? Nível A? Joga muito. Nível A, não. Nível, nível B forte. Oh. Joga nas duas. Pô. All right. Meu irmão. So, if Anybody has any final questions, concerns, doubts? This is your time to share it. Um, if not, Marcos, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you here. Hopefully this uh, will provide people enough information to help them with whatever they want to achieve in their nation. Um, maybe not for the ones that participated now, but the ones that will see this over the next 24 hours. And um, hopefully we we'll we'll actually use this as a stepping stone for us to do more on a development standpoint because that's definitely very important for the sport to grow. Yeah, true. Thanks, Luis, for the opportunity with uh, World Football League. Um, very happy to hear talking with, uh, about this subject that I love, that is my life, my profession. I live... Uh, my learning are from football, so that's my life. And like, I'm also free to ask any question, like on my Instagram. If you want my number to clarify, to I'm here to help and uh, help the sport uh, grow. And if you wanna come to Rio, like I need help, where to stay, where to play. I will tell you like to go to learn with me, to learn with someone else, to learn with everybody, which will be good for your future, for your game, and perhaps to your life. <laughs> Perfect. Obrigado, Marquinhos. Boa noite. Valeu. Bom, bom descanso aí. E espero que o pessoal tenha curtido. Obrigado, pessoal, por comparecer também. também. Boa noite. Valeu. Tchau, tchau. Tchau, tchau.